Well, greetings. It's good to be with you again as we consider, or continue rather, our study in the holiness of God. In our last session, we looked at the character of God's holiness, and today we'll be considering God's call to holiness. You know, God is a holy being, perfect in every way, uh, separate and above all of creation. And the only way that God can have a relationship with us is to make us holy. And so today we're going to be considering God's call to be holy as I am holy. We find this verse repeated twice, once in the Old Testament and once in the New. In Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 45, we read, For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And again, we find the Apostle Peter quoting that same verse uh, in his letter, in verse uh, 15 and verse 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And so we're going to try and answer the question, what does it mean to be holy? One of the first things I want to do is review the attributes of God. We did this uh, in our last session. We considered what these attributes were uh, of God, and they included things like his sovereignty, his eternal nature, uh, his omnipotence, his mercy, his self-existence, his transcendence, his goodness, his justice, his imminence, his immutability, his omniscience, his love, his omnipresence, and his grace. Uh, and all of these seem best through uh, his holiness. Uh, we considered last week that there are some who said that uh, this is God's defining attribute, his holiness. Um, and I was not convinced of that uh, position only because it implies that uh, other of God's attributes are inferior to his holiness. But I found a great quote that I think comes very close to the definition, a good definition, uh, for how holiness relates to the other attributes of God. This is a quote by Harold Wilmington, uh, who was a professor of Bible at Liberty University for many years, now retired, and I think gone home to be with the Lord. Uh, but he said this of holiness. God's holiness is a single perfection that would perhaps come closer to describing the eternal creator than any characteristic he possesses. It is the union of all other attributes, as pure white light is the union of all the colored, colored rays of the spectrum. And I like that. You know, as we think of the colors of the, uh, of the spectrum, every color is defined in itself. Every color is perfectly uh, pure, uh, but all those colors together uh, become pure white light. Uh, and that really is the picture of the holiness of God. All of his attributes seen most clearly uh, defined uh, in his holiness. And so as we uh, continue, I want to look at some of the attributes of God that we can share and others that we cannot share. Um, we find uh, there are all of these attributes we just listed, but many of them, God never calls us to be sovereign or omnipotent or self-existent or transcendent or omniscient or any of these other things. But we are called to be merciful, to show goodness, to have justice, his love, his grace, and of course, to be a uh, holy. You know, in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, we read that great verse that says, uh, What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? And, you know, we love mercy. We do love mercy, especially when that mercy is shown to us. But we are not always good at demonstrating mercy to others. Our mercy is the mercy of God, or is to reflect the mercy of God, is to be seen in Him. Many years ago, I heard the story of a, of a small town judge, and uh, one morning, uh, a man that the judge had known for many years, in fact, they had gone to school together, appeared before him in court. Uh, he had committed an offense that demanded a penalty. 
And those that knew the relationship of this man and the judge, uh, they expected the judge to deal with the man mercifully because they were friends. And they were very surprised when they heard that the sentence imposed by the judge was a very, very heavy fine for the offense. And the man was unable to pay that fine. But they were even more surprised when the judge went to the officer of the court and took from his own pocket the money to pay that heavy fine. And so this man did his duty as a judge. There was a justice was served, uh, but he upheld the law. But he also showed something of the mercy of God for his friend when he paid that penalty uh, for his friend. The Lord Jesus Christ uh, tells his disciples, therefore be merciful just as your father also is merciful. We find that in Luke chapter 6. And I think this is just one example of the way the attributes of God can be seen in our lives. We are called to be merciful and good and just and loving and filled with grace and to be holy. As we said earlier, God never calls us to be sovereign or omnipotent or omnipresent or transcendent. We cannot be any of those things. But our life should reflect the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so again, we ask the question, how does that answer our, our earlier question? How do we be holy? How, what does it mean to be holy? I think uh, some of you are familiar with A.W. Tozer. Uh, he had this to say about holiness. The true Christian ideal is not to be happy, but holy. The whole purpose of God in redemption is to make us holy and to restore us to the image of God. To accomplish this, he disengages us from earthly ambitions and draws us away from the cheap and unworthy prizes that worldly men set their hearts on. I think there's some truth in that. There is truth in that. God calls us to be holy. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, as we think about Paul and we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore I urge you, imitate me. This is what he's saying to the believers. Um, that's a bold challenge. Imitate me. Uh, I'm not sure I'd want anybody imitating me. Uh, certainly a lot of portions of me or parts of me. But he goes on in the same letter in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1 where he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so one of the keys to, to holiness is our imitation of Christ. Lastly, Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. And so, yes, we can follow others who are following Christ. We can follow others around us. And I think in my own experience, I think of many who uh, set a wonderful example for me as I was growing up, and I followed their example. I did what they did, and, uh, and it stood me in good stead. But we have to be careful about who we imitate. There's a story <clears throat> told of President Calvin Coolidge, uh, who years ago invited some people from his hometown to come and have dinner at the White House. And since they did not know how to behave on such an occasion, they decided that the best thing to do would be to follow the lead of the president. Everything he did, they would do. And so they did this throughout the meal, and then came time for coffee. And so as the president poured his coffee, uh, he poured a portion of it into a saucer. And as soon as the home folk saw that, they then poured coffee into their saucers. Then he added some milk and some sugar and stirred it up in the saucer. So the home people did the same thing. They poured in the milk, they poured in the sugar, and they stirred it up. And then the next step that the president did um, was he took that saucer of coffee and he put it on the floor and called his cat. And so... These uh, folk were very embarrassed because they had been following an example. That really wasn't an example for them to follow. And so I think uh, the lesson that we learn from that is that we follow the one who is holy, the one who is already holy. We find, number one, Jesus Christ is the one referred to as the Holy One. Now remember, as we looked at it last week, the term the Holy One is a title used in the Old Testament referring to God over 50 times 
in the Old Testament. But again, we find it in the New Testament referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, first of all, he's testified by angels. Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. I'll just read that uh, for you. It says, The angel answered and said to her, that is to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And so we see the testimony of the angels in this case. We also see that he was testified by demons. They testified to the fact that he was the Holy One. They recognized who he was and what his character was. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 23, we read, Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. And so they actually speak in an expanded term. Not only is he the Holy One, but the Holy One of God. So testified by angels, testified by demons, but also testified by the apostles. In Acts chapter 3, we read this as Peter talking about the uh, to the leaders, the Jewish leaders. He says, But you denied the Holy One and the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And so here he's called the Holy One and the Just. And so his just character is also seen in his holiness. And so Jesus Christ is the Holy One. And life in Christ, number two, is the key to that holiness. I'm going to read a few passages together. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, we can turn to that passage. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 22, and we'll read down to verse 27. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 22. Um, and in this, the thought uh, in this passage is that he is holy and he saved us. He is holy and he saved us. Verse 22, by so much more Jesus has become the surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, see the eternal nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, has an unchangeable priesthood. Another attribute of the Lord Jesus Christ is his immutability. He has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, and here's a description of him, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself." And so this is the key that we find is the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is holy and he saved us. Secondly, we find that he is holy and we are to imitate him. Uh, we've referred to that passage already, but let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Uh, he is holy and we are to imitate him. Several things we'll notice in this passage as we read it. One is that we are in Christ. Secondly, it refers to things, old things, new things, and all things. And we find all things are in God. And so we get both of those uh, aspects, in Christ and in God. And then lastly, we are righteous because he is righteous. So let's read the passage together. Uh, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And here's where it gets important here. It says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. 
We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We're going to come back to that verse in just a minute, but I want to just read it one more time. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then thirdly, we see here our holiness found in the life of Christ. Uh, that is the key. Therefore, uh, sorry, rather, uh, we, he is holy and we are to learn of him. So first of all, he is holy and, we, and he saved us. He is holy and we imitate him. He is holy and we are to learn of him. In Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17, we read this. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who are past feeling, having given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to his deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And so don't walk as the Gentiles, darkened in understanding, alienated from God. We're to learn of him. The things of the Gentiles, the things of the world, are not things that we learn from Christ. From Christ, we learned these new things. We learn to walk a holy life through Christ because we have heard him, we have been taught by him through his word. And so we put off the old, and again, we put on <clears throat> the new. I want to read one more uh, quote here from J.C. Ryle. Uh, J.C. Ryle goes back to the 1800s. Uh, he was a British uh, clergyman who said this about holiness. Holiness is the habit of being of one mind with God, according as we find his mind described in Scripture. It is the habit of agreeing in God's judgment, hating what he hates, loving what he loves, and measuring everything in this world by the standard of his word. I think that's a great definition of what holiness means, what God believes holiness to be, hating the things that he hates, loving the things that he loves, and measuring everything by the standard of the word of God. So I want to just touch on this before we go to our last point uh, in this section, and that is what does it mean to be holy? What is the meaning of sanctification? We read that uh, often, the thought to be sanctified. Sanctification means to be separate or to be made holy, to be made holy. And this is not a work that we can do ourselves. We certainly have a part to play in it. When we are separated to God, we are separated to holiness, and we need to do some of that work, as we were just reminded in our last passage. Um, but it falls into three categories. Positional sanctification, that is, when we are saved, as far as God is concerned, we have been made righteous. When he looks at us, he sees the righteousness of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's positionally. And, you know, when we think of him positionally, we think of this verse we refer to, that he became sin for us. That's a hard uh, verse to understand, and, and many people have misinterpreted it, uh, because God, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, was sinless. Uh, he did not sin. He could not sin. He did not turn into sin. He did not become a sinner or is not guilty of sin. So what does that mean, that he became sin for us? Well, throughout Scripture, the word sin uh, is translated as sin as we know it, uh, the sin of the world or the sin of an individual. But many times, and quite a number of times, over a hundred times, it's the same word, the exact same word is translated sin offering. Uh, 
And so the truth is that the Lord Jesus Christ became the sin offering for us. And again, as we discussed last week, all of those offerings of God were holy offerings. And so the Lord Jesus Christ never lost his holiness in the fact that he became sin for us. And he didn't lose his righteousness when we became uh, the righteousness of God in him. Um, this is His righteousness is seen in us. He didn't lose it in any way. Uh, he did not give up his righteousness. He became, we became righteous in God's sight as a new creation. And so that's our positional sanctification. As soon as we're saved, we are forever saved. We are ever um, righteous in God's sight, even though um, there are, because our sins have been forgiven. Uh, but there are times when we do sin, and we need to make uh, confession of that. And so we find this daily sanctification. There's an interesting verse that we read here uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm just going to read a couple of the verses. It's a longer passage, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 12, but I want to just highlight several phrases from that passage, starting in verse 1. It says, Brethren, you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. We find that in verse 1. Then in verse 3 we read, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, something that has to be made on a continual basis. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness, in verse 7. And then lastly, verse 12, and this is the phrase that I, that I really like here, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing that you may walk properly, correctly, before God. God wants us to be holy. He wants us to be blameless as we walk before him. Romans chapter 13 makes a similar uh, claim uh, in verse 12 to 14. It says here, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. It's very clear that there is need for daily cleansing, daily sanctification. Uh, the priests of the Old Testament had to do it. Uh, they were always priests, but they also had to be cleansed. We, too, have been saved. We've been made priests um, in, in God's sight. We've been sanctified forever, but we also need daily cleansing uh, of, from the things of this world. And again, we get that thought of putting off and, and putting on. And then lastly, we might call it eternal sanctification. That is one day when we go to be, the Lord Jesus, to be with the Lord Jesus Christ for eternity, uh, at his coming, we shall all be changed. We read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. That means without sin, without corruption. And we shall be changed, for this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And then in Romans chapter 8, we'll just read that verse uh, very quickly as well, because I think it makes the, the same point for us. Romans chapter 8 and verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. And so we, we're looking forward, the whole world is looking forward, the whole earth, creation, groans in anticipation of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then just lastly, I'd like to just look at this passage, where again, we're very familiar with it, Colossians chapter 3, uh, and actually verse 1 to verse 17. And with the time we have remaining, we're not going to read the entire passage, but I want to just touch on uh, four points uh, from this passage, but I would encourage you, when you get home today, go back to Colossians chapter uh, chapter 3 and read from verse 1 to verse 17. The first part of it we see here is set your mind on the heavenly. Set your mind on the heavenly. Uh, 
the question is asked there in the verse, since then, or, or if then, or since then, you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And so set your mind on the heavenly. We are often too occupied with the earthly, with the things of this earth. We're to set our minds on the things above. Secondly, it says there in verse 5, put to death the earthly. So set your mind on the heavenly, put to death the earthly. Um, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming <clears throat> upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. So there's our first two steps. Set our minds on the things above, put to death the earthly. And then it goes on in verse 8 to say, put off the old man, and then starting in verse 10, put on the new man. And so there's this, again, putting off and putting on of the old and the new. Uh, <clears throat> verse 8 says, but now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. That's a process of putting off those things. And we might say, well, I'm not guilty of the other things, of fornication and uncleanness and evil desire and covetousness. Maybe I am, maybe I, I'm not. But I would say for most of us, we still struggle with things like anger and wrath and malice. And these things are part of us, and we need to put them out of our lives. Uh, we do it with the power of the Holy Spirit and the help of the Holy Spirit. But we have to be an active participant in the putting off of that. And then lastly, as we read this, it says to put on the new man. It says that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a if anyone has a complaint against another even as Christ forgave you so you also must do but above all these put on love again another of the attributes of God we should have love as part of our character part of our uh, spiritual attribute as well uh, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Here's a wonderful picture of what it looks like to live a holy life. In that constant state of putting things off, putting the old things off, and putting the new things on. Putting off the things of the world, and putting on the character of Christ. Following after him, doing those things that he uh, has done um, for us and who went before us. You know, I read just as we finish, I re read this another quote. This is a man, James Augie. Um, he was a, a, an abolitionist, one who spoke out strongly against slavery in the South uh, in the U.S. many, many years ago. Uh, just a, a very outspoken man, but had a strong position about holiness. And he said this, remember that holiness is not the way to Christ. Christ is the way to holiness. We cannot become holy uh, as a way of salvation, as a way to look for salvation. We can't put on new things and do good works. So holiness is not the way to Christ. We can't try to be holy in order to become uh, perfect uh, in this life. We can only uh, have Christ in our life that leads us to holiness. And so we see that wonderful picture of bringing together uh, 
uh, the command of holiness and the person of holiness uh, matched in our lives together. Let's uh, pray together. Uh, Father, we do thank you again for this brief time we've had in your word as we consider God's call to holiness. Uh, Father, we thank you that because you are holy and because you've called us to holiness, uh, it's an expectation for all believers. Uh, this is not something that an unbeliever can do. They cannot be holy before you because they are not sanctified or set apart by you. And yet we know that trying to live a holy life without Christ uh, is not a, the way of salvation. It is a works-based way. But once we belong to you, once we are saved, once we are your children, uh, once that we belong to you, we're to live holy lives. And so we pray that you would help us to do that. Uh, we pray that you would help us to look at the uh, activities, behavior, and conduct of our life and examine it uh, against the Lord Jesus Christ, examine it against his behavior and conduct and teaching. Uh, Father, it is too easy for us to look upon the world and say, well, I'm better than that part of the world or I'm better than those sinners. Um, this is not what it means to be holy. We hold ourselves up against the person of Christ. And so we pray that you would make it very clear in our hearts and lives uh, what is unholy uh, character, unholy behavior in our lives, and that we might continually seek after Christ and seek to be like Christ. We can only do that by surrendering, our, surrendering ourselves uh, fully to him. And so, our Father, we ask that for each one that's here today. We ask that you would bless them, help them, encourage them, strengthen them. And our Father, we pray that day by day uh, we might be changed from glory to glory. And so we just commit each one here now into your hands. We ask your blessing upon them in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much for our time together today.